permission of uh, the uh, participants and also the speakers later on we are hoping to upload this on our official uh, youtube channel uh, that's uh, uh, something to think about later on uh, so thank you very much uh, for uh, joining with us today uh, uh, so uh, this uh, whole uh, discussion about sari and uh, the story of the sari the cultural discourses surrounding the sari in sri lanka so uh, this idea of having doing something on international women's day actually our dean uh, dr kamalika jayatilaka actually came up with the idea that we should do something on uh, international women's day and uh, so uh, that was a, in a we, we actually got to know okay uh, next week is on international women's day okay what are we going to do uh, so uh, we didn't have that much of time to prepare and uh, i came up with the idea so why don't we talk about the sari uh because uh, i have had a keen interest of uh, studying uh, this uh, piece of cloth uh, for a certain period of time now and uh, i thought it it would be better that uh, if we can have a discussion on this uh but one my thing okay what is it uh, spec specifically about sari it's just piece of cloth but uh, and it's very personal uh but sometimes uh, i think uh, personal things can also be very political Uh, so that's why we are here today uh, to talk about the sari uh, and uh, discourses surrounding the sari in sri lanka uh, to give a start for the session i'll just explain the rationale uh, why i had this thought for a certain period of time uh, and my experience is related to sari so the the first uh, the experience that i noticeably uh, Uh, try to think about the sari because uh, as girls we all play with saris and everything but uh, the most uncomfortable experience that i had with the with the sari was uh, when i was uh, schooling uh, like i i went to a uh, like a popular girl school uh, and uh, i got sick one day uh, and uh, my mother had to escort me like my mother came to like take me home and she too was a, a teacher but on this day she was on leave and she was wearing casual and she came to the school so this was a long period long time ago uh, and uh, she was not allowed to enter the school uh, even though i was sick uh, i was taken to the gate and handed over me to my mom and from there onwards we came home so i was wondering what is it about the sari and uh, after that numerous occasions in my life uh, i have been asked in certain uh, situations uh, uh, so okay uh, why are you not wearing a sari to this occasion right uh, why didn't you wear a, wear a sari you should have wear a sari right and in certain times like i have also had uh, you know more more respect uh, and the attitude that i am more mature when i was wearing a sari uh, so uh, with that notion i started to do a small research last year about uh, opinions uh, of uh, women who are working about their their ideas and their experiences related to the sari so uh, that is the uh, back story to this uh, whole uh, webinar uh, so uh, to start this session uh, i would like to introduce you our two speakers uh for those who don't know i uh, uh we have uh, dr janaki jayawardena vidas uh, dr janaki is a senior lecturer in department of history university of colombo uh, she has a phd in women studies from university of york uk and uh, she uh, is a uh, she has research interest in cultural history and gender studies and also we have ms gunnati samaravira uh, one of my mentors and i think my one of my good friends uh, and uh, miss unadi is from, uh, from also from university of colombo department of sociology uh, she is at the moment is studying for uh, right reading for her phd in university of canterbury uh, new zealand so uh, to start the session uh, i would like to uh, uh, start the session with dr janaki so uh, so is dr janaki is it uh, really sri lankan the sari so what is it about uh, the sari everywhere in, uh, with regard to sri lankan women you can start the session yeah i mean uh, uh, 
if we talk about anything social i don't think we can say that uh, you know things are sort of you know uh, limit to a one particular area region or country right so uh, especially when it comes to cultural symbols and uh, artifacts and ideas uh, and knowledge uh, they travel all the time uh, regardless of time uh, and change uh, the civilizational aspects in various uh, regions in the world when I mean, in that sense i can say that sari does not particularly belong to any any region right uh, the birth of the sari actually happened in mohenjodoro harappa a long time back uh, veranga shall i uh, start with my uh, yes yes of course powerpoint yeah sorry uh, this powerpoint was made actually because i was asked to um, actually talk about sari on social media and uh, i have made a powerpoint for that yeah uh, this is what i'm going to use but with slight changes because you were much more interested in talking about the discourse of the sari and uh, and uh, please pardon me about my my powerpoint presentation because i was not well i didn't have much time to prepare it as well um but uh, you know it's like a mixture of singhala and um, english and you know just so but i think somehow you all can go through that and uh, uh, yeah um, so i will i'm i'm going to talk about three things the history of the sari and then um, the the colonial and nationalist discourse around the sari i mean as veranga said i also got interested in 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 studying about the sari because of two things like uh, an incident that happened in my department like after coming uh, to the department wearing trousers uh, in in one of the me departmental meetings uh, suddenly the head wanted to speak about the dress and then uh, he pointedly said my name and uh, you know i by that time i actually uh, you know sort of checked my uh, contract and also checked what are the legal uh, you know possibilities uh, surround you know wearing uh, dresses to your office so i had some prior knowledge when i was you know confronted with this issue and i told them that my contract does not say that i should wear a sari what it says is wear an appropriate dress and if you look at the i think unnati will speak out speak about it uh, you know if you look at the the constitution of sri lanka it also endorses that women have freedom right and also the other thing is the the, the legal aspects of you know you uh, an institution can propose a uh, propose a uh, uniform but not a dress uh, that is particularly you know belong to a certain cultural community or a group so i knew about it that's one thing um, and then the other thing is that then i got interested in you know looking at this and uh, so the other thing that made me interest in in studying about the sari was um uh was actually um, um uh, after reading amita ghosh novel the glass palace right in in one uh, episode you know when the exiled queen was looking out to the uh, to you know towards the ocean to see the indian delegation you know they came in a boat and she sees this uh, lady and she asks what is she, what is that she is wearing right so someone says a sari so my idea was that sari was something ancient right and then why so this is what actually led me to you know look at the scholarly research on sari so my presentation actually based on the the, the findings that i 
uh, the collected uh, for some time on sari. Okay, if we look at the history of the sari, right? So as I have said, uh, the, the scholarly uh, uh, opinion is that the uh, sari became a dress when weaving was started in uh, Mohenjo-daro Harappa civilization somewhere uh, 500, uh, sorry, 5000 BC, right? But uh, the sari, didn't have the same uh, name. It was called Satika. Uh, and in, in, in Pali, it's called Salua. And later on, it became Sari. Uh, uh, earlier on, it was a unstitched garment. And also interestingly, uh, my, my research uh, pointed that uh, it was the dress of the dress of a, a wider uh, geographical area, uh, uh, what we call South Asia and Southeast Asia, I, I sort of was able to, you know, connect and see that the, the, it was the dress of the, this, this vast uh, geographical area. And also the other thing is that, interesting thing is that Sari or Satika was the dress of both men and women. Right? So there was no gendered difference in, in the dress at that time. So this, uh, these plates I got from Charles Fabry's uh, 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 book on uh, dress in, in, in India. You can see in various time period how the sari was worn by both men and women. Actually, when you look at these plates, it's very obvious that there was no gender difference, gender difference between men and women at all in that time period. You see, certain times it was worn up to the ankle and the upper part of the body was bare. Sometimes it was worn like this, right? Uh, one part of the garment was up to the ankle and there was another uh, garment wrapped around the body. And sometimes it was very short up to the ankle. And if you look at the, the accessories that went with the dress, uh, were same for both and both men and women. Even the, the hairstyles were not very different because both men and women had long hair and they're you know, tied up on the head as a knot. And the accessories, if you look at the ankles and bangles and uh, uh, necklaces and um, sorry, uh, the, the, the ear studs were same for both men and women. So if we look at the pictures from, these were some pictures I got from Cambodia when I visited there. If you look at the, the dress patterns, you can see that, you know, there is no difference between men and women. This is from India. And it was the same in Sri Lanka as well, right? If when you visit the the ancient uh, uh, historical sites, we never see fully clad men or women uh, as in today. And this actually changed with the the colonial uh, intervention because you know the the, the colonial rulers were very much interested in civilizing the, 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 the natives in our part of the world. Uh, and uh, more, many ideas about uh, culture and you know, way of living and our habits and our traditions and also uh, you know, our dress patterns were changed due to you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, bringing uh, ideas from Christian civilization and also from the 
the the the discourses on sex and sexuality that prevailed in at that time in 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 Europe. So, uh, if you look at the the early colonial period, you can see uh, during the the nineteenth uh, century actually certain changes were taking place in in terms of attire, right? Uh, as it says here, during Mauryan and Gupta dynasties, uh, the sari was used as either unstitched or stitched garment. And the men wore it in, in different styles called Bangla Lungi, Dhoti, then Sari Jama, and An Angarka. Angarka is the small uh, 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 blouse that wore on the top and uh, there was a headband as well. So the women wore it as sari, salva, dupatta. And, and in India, there are uh, more than, I think 80 styles of uh, wear, uh, wearing sari. And originally sari is a three piece dress. I'll show it later on. So there was a lower ga garment, chest band, which is called, um, uh, Stanpatta, and then the veil, right? Later on, this became a single garment uh, as, as six yards. And then the idea, the uh, idea was that sari should leave the midriff bare because it, it was connected with an ancient tradition in India uh, you know, the, the, this uh, religious belief that navel of the supreme being is the source of life and creativity. So the idea was not to cover the navel, but to bear it. And um, I think I should, uh, the chest band was uh, introduced to India later at a time. And uh, even though it says it was not a standard practice for all women to wear a, a chest band, it, it, depend, uh, it, it depended on the regional customs, class, or even the climate, right? And, and I was told, I, I couldn't confirm it, actually this wearing a chest band was actually for the, the Greek maid, maids who came to serve in India for the, the noble families. So it was the, the custom for the noble uh, men and women was not to cover the chest. Please excuse me. Sorry, um, I'm getting a call. Hello, Mang Wata Paul Gandhina. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I was getting this call. Um, so uh, it also say that wearing a, 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 a chest band uh, was actually an influence from who uh, came to India as visitor, visitors or you know invaders that they brought this, this uh, uh, style of, uh, you know, covering the chest with the uh, chest band uh, for women. But uh, by the time of the, the British came to Sri Lanka, it seems, sorry, to India, it, it seems it was the practice during the Mughal period was to, you know, join the, the, upper garment and lower garment as one single garment. So this garment was the, the, the cloth, piece of cloth that became the sari as we know today. So this was the, the style, the three garments, if you see this, the chest band and then the the upper, the, the, the piece of cloth that covered the upper part of the body or the chest, and then the 
lower garment which was worn either up to the knee or to the ankle depending on certain time periods so these are also actually you know can call as as evolutions of uh, you know sari so this these were the dresses for men and uh, here also you can see on 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 to your right you know the men and women in that uh, picture are wearing uh, garments almost in a similar style uh, this is a picture i got from robert knox uh, on on, on uh, sri lankan uh, people where you can see that you know wearing amude and also a piece of cloth up to your knee was a practice in sri lanka for both men and women so this is one style of uh, wearing sari in india in ancient times you can see that uh, you know it was a, as a single garment but there was no blouse no undergarments just it it covered the entire body up to chest and uh, actually the undergarments were uh, introduced by the 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 europeans uh, whereas the blouse was introduced by the persian culture to india and also uh, uh, the neria or the pleats in on sari was also worn uh, differently at certain time periods like mostly it was the the, the pleats were on the back of the garment rather than the side that we you know put it uh, today and uh, this is a kerala woman wearing uh, you know the osari uh, you can see that the pleats are on the the back of the sari like that in this earlier picture so the blouse as i have said uh blouse was introduced to the sari by uh, sister sister in law of rabindranath tagore right so this is the most modern form of blouse and actually the the way that we draped the sari and you know using blouse and undergarment was actually uh, started during the colonial period in in uh, india and uh, the main reason is that um you know uh, nudity was not something to be ashamed in ancient cultures it's very obvious that both in you know in 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 south east south asia and south east asia nudity was not considered as something to be ashamed of right so we had a different idea about shame and fear uh, prior to the colonial intervention but the colonial rulers in their mindset about civilizing the people here you now they introduced new ideas about you know shame and fear to our cultures so not covering your body has become a shame uh, during the colonial times and uh, you know uh, basically you know introducing the victorian morality into our culture had a big influence on the way we think about uh, you know sex sexuality and also the way we think about you know our own uh, bodies so the biological body actually became a site of you know uh, uh, expressing certain uh, ideas uh, sort of uh, uh, brought into our parts of the world started with the colonial intervention so you can see that uh, in india when uh, uh, the modernization took place uh, the creation of the modern indian woman actually embedded certain uh, or these certain of these you know ideas and uh, traditions and customs that 
we 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 borrowed from the west so it was um, you know during this time that uh, rabindranath tagore's uh, family uh, has started wearing uh, sari and also making it a you know kind of uh, indian attire as well so it's not just you know a dress that draped on the body it has become a dress that actually represent nationality of a certain country as well during the the british colonial uh, period with the with uh, you know the 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 struggle against uh, the imperialism as well so um, you can see that uh, sari was used as a you know certain form of resistance during uh, the british colonial time in in, in india so this incident where that she tried to uh, you know the, the sister in law of rabindranath tagore trying to enter the english club wearing a bengali sari and uh, she was uh, not allowed to go in saying that it was not a proper attire right so but for the indigenous people it became a modern dress that actually uh, you know cover the body and you know display the modesty of the the indian culture especially for women and also gradually the sari became the dress of the women only right so this is a picture of her and if i switch to sri lanka uh, similar uh, thing things happened in, in in sri lanka as well right when the the colonial people uh, travel to our part of the world they had certain uh, imaginary about the people in in these areas mostly uh, asians and uh, asians were described as uh you know uh, they are they are very uh, different from uh the europeans and they are very exotic right if you look at the colonial literature and the the, the pictures the way uh, the women especially the women were depicted was like they are very exotic something to be you know looked at and admired uh, so kind of an object to uh, to you know sort of uh, enjoy but uh, when you read uh, you know few literature written by uh, europeans who came to sri lanka as civil uh, servants and uh, travelers and uh, planters you know they actually did not held that idea about sri lankan men and women and for, about men they they thought men look very feminine and only the presence or absence of the beard or mustache that made a difference between men and women so the idea was that men and women look the same so uh, from from their view point it is something to be uh, you know something repulsive disgusting so uh, i i got this image from one of the websites you see that uh, this is a boy climbing a coconut tree this is the image that the european uh, europeans were talking about like how uh, men look uh, very feminine in in sri lanka especially among the singhalis right and uh, if you look at this this book cover i got uh, you know it was from 1915 you can see when you look at the picture of the both man and the woman in the in the picture the dress patterns are very similar right you don't see a difference between uh, the attire of the man and the woman so this was something that colonial uh, rulers felt uh, something something uncivilized something that 
cannot be accepted especially the long hair of the men and also wearing the tortoise shell uh, that was the style of the day was uh, criticized by all you know who written about the natives about uh, in in sri lanka so this is a picture from a village so you can see right women are actually they they are Uh, they don't they didn't cover the upper part of the body but wearing a cloth up to the ankle and there's one woman uh, you know sort of draping another garment over her body so this was the style for both men and women in uh, india uh, sri lanka and and you know other part of southeast asia as well um, and also uh, in in the 19th century sri lankan society was very much cosmopolitan and what you can see is that with the the influence from other cultures our way of dressing was varied right this is a picture of a, a low country man and a woman you can see that you know they are neither wearing sari uh, but you know some some uh, styles of the day and uh, the uh, the low country men were sort of thought as hybrid men because they were european and uh, asian uh, clothes and this is a boy low country signal is boy you can see that the tortoise shell comb on the head long hair and then european coat uh, shirt and a sarong sarang was actually uh, from uh, southeast asia and uh, not just the gender difference but ethnicity was also not marked by the dress of the the people at the time right if you look at the the pictures here you can see uh, the singala man with very long hair and a tortoise shell comb on the head and you know upper part of the body was bare and and wearing a short cloth similarly the the tamil man also attired in 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 same manner uh, these are pictures of a tamil woman and a singala woman you can see the the colonial influence and you know uh, so these were the the styles of the time and both uh, singala and tamil women uh, used to wear such clothes and uh, it was during the british colonial period especially that uh, gender was marked on the biological body of the natives and also ethnicity it was actually a part of the 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 colonial partly because of the colonial way of uh, trying to understand our societies and i don't think i have much time to talk about it but uh, you know if you read nira vikramasinghe's book on uh, sri lanka in the modern age she she speaks about authenticating the native body by the british rulers right in order to understand who the natives were british the british used uh, several techniques to uh, sort of cat categorize and classify us and according to this categorization and classification the british introduced uh, a new uh, uniforms or dresses to the natives when participating in public events and official ceremonies and the british because they thought the kandians were authentic singalis they uh, uh, proposed a dress that actually was different from the low country singalis and uh, you know and introduced certain new elements to that dress uh, from south india the 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 headgear and the 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 shoes right similarly for the low country singalis they thought they were 
hybrid Sinhalese because they were, you know, ruled by the colonial uh, rulers for a long time. They are not very authentic Sinhalese, so they were allowed to, you know, sort of wear certain European items such as coat and shirt and a sarong. Um, so these pictures actually I wanted to show you. So one picture is about the Candian chiefs, where again you can see that the, the, the hat they are wearing is flat. It's different from the hat that the Candian uh, dress, uh, sort of attached to the Candian dress today and not wearing shoes or not a, you know, this long bottom uh, underneath it and the chest was bare. So this is the actually uh, uh, the attire that introduced by the British to the Candian, uh, authentic Candian dress. So this Nilame dress or whatever we call today, it was actually invented during the British colonial times. And these two ladies on the bottom are actually uh, Candian women. Again, you can see that uh, the way of wearing sari was very different at that time. And uh, again, you can see the, the woman with this uh, man on this picture is wearing a osari, which is different from the garments that uh, worn by the uh, Candian women uh, uh, before the, uh, towards the end of the 19th century. So, I want to talk about how nationalism and gender impacted uh, our way of, you know, looking at sari. Uh, it was during the British period, uh, both in India and Sri Lanka, nationalism was, uh, nationalism emerged to, uh, you know, uh, to do away with uh, imperialism and uh, as uh, scholars have pointed out, both in India and Sri Lanka, new traditions were invented to demarcate us from the English or the British. And at the same time, with uh, nationalism, there was another need to demarcate ourselves from the rest of the communities that were in uh, rest of the other native communities uh, in the same country. If you look at in India, the Hindus and the Muslims, and here in Sri Lanka, it was uh, mainly uh, Sinhalese, Muslims, and the Tamils. So the nationalist leaders also invented certain dress patterns for uh, their native communities in order to, you know, mark ethnic boundaries between these communities that were uh, living in uh, their own countries. So um, um, I talk, took this from uh, a leaflet or, the, or a document done by uh, Anagarika Dharmapala in 1894. And uh, this was called Gihidina Charyava. Uh, on the surface, it's, it's a sort of, you know, set of uh, advice to the people how to, you know, live their daily life. But it was something more than that, if you analyze the document. And here, he proposed a singular anuma for men, right? According to him, uh, ancient kings, actually, they wore a cloth and then uh, draped another cloth over the upper part of the body and had a uh, headband. And uh, according to him, even during Dutugamanu times, Singhalese had short hair and uh, had a headband. And then he proposed that Singhalese should stop wearing sarong, sarong which came from Southeast Asia, then the trousers from the Europeans, and then this uh, you know, tortoise shell uh, comb on the head, and you know, give away all that, and wear a white cloth or silk cloth and a short blouse on top, and uh, 
have a uh, what you call a sartake over the short uh, blouse right and then headband and wear shoes as well that is the dress for the singhala men right so he he was saying that singhali should not wear amude like vaddo or saram like muslims or uh, like uh, portuguese should not wear trousers like portuguese and uh, uh, like the ja people from uh, south uh, east asia should not wear a comb or on head and also this you know this there was another way of you know uh, wearing uh, clothes at this time it was called vedde uh, mahatya by the people at the time so wearing a, a hat with a cloth draped over that and then the usual tortoise shell form then the collar tie the undergarment and then the shirt waist coat coat the trouser and the the cloth over the trouser and then wearing uh, shoes and socks so all these were worn at the same time uh, by men at this time so it was also he said that was a ridiculous dress people should not wear such dresses i actually had a picture of one such uh, man but uh, i couldn't put it here today and then you know about women he had a long list of advice for women and where that's where he said should wear a blouse and that blouse should cover the the breast the the midriff and also the back of the uh, the the upper part of the body and also wear a wear osariya or sari right so it was actually uh, his mother who started uh, wearing the sari first uh, according to what i heard so this idea that women should wear a sari or osari and osari should be the the national dress of the women actually became very uh, you know uh, it was uh, became very popular at the time and this i took from a paper in 1921 now according to this um, uh, letter written to this newspaper mahajana handa by a woman it says that uh, the security of our nation is on the hands of our sisters so it is the duty of women to safeguard the honor of the nation therefore they are supposed to be ad adhere into good customs and uh, it says decline of our sorry disappearing of our, our national dress uh, took uh, you know happened in the last few centuries so the idea that we had a national dress when we were not a nation and that has disappeared due to you know at uh, sort of uh, uh, following uh, european uh, dress styles so it says that now it's time to pay a special attention to what we wear and for specifically it says women should wear osariya but no other dresses right so the idea implied here is that osariya was the dress of the women uh, since the beginning of our uh, history right so and it actually cited this uh, uh, kavya from uh, kavya shekare which uh, 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 according to uh, martin vikramasinghe was translated from uh, translated by rahul hamudro from uh, a hindu document of uh, 15th century 
so according to this you know that you have to cover the uh, the cover your body with the cloth from navel to ankle ankles and a blouse that made to cover breast properly and then blouse also should cover by a fold of the sari and it is named as a aryan singhala osari dress so this idea or the ideology that osari is the aryan singhala dress buddhist dress was actually invented by anagarika dharmapala in the late 19th century so if you look at early pictures of women wearing sari there again you can see that there is no national sorry no cultural difference between the way as the tamil and singhala women wore the sari but in the early 20th century this dress actually became i'm sorry i i don't know whether you can see it because uh, yeah i got this picture from a, a small booklet in uh, that was from 1916 actually uh, with a picture of a woman wearing this garment it says osari hevat arya singhala dress and it advise women uh, saying that to see the the nobility of this dress you need to wear it and also it says that various uh, styles were imported from india so the idea that the na nationalism or sorry uh, idea that the nationality of a community can be uh, expressed on the biological body was actually uh, you know sort of established and emerged during the uh, the early uh, 20th century in when a nationalism emerged to fight against imperialism so these two pictures actually from uh, two ladies from the period you can see that they are wearing a blouse and a osari with the you know this way certain way of draping it the over the body and also because of absence of certain, you know suitable footwear they were wearing shoes and socks with the osari and also osari was a uh, sort of a dress of the women of the upper class also because uh, lower class women used to wear a blouse and a cloth what we call red the hat and dharmapala ridiculed that dress as well because he said that dress uh, bears the midriff of women and also the legs of women and he he said the signal is women are short black and ugly and they are bearing their ugly midriff and the legs so his advice was to do away with that dress and wear osari and uh, this actually was from uh, somewhere in 1950s from a newspaper and here what it says i'm sorry i'm sure that you can't read my um, handwriting what it says is that the sari should uh, represent the indigenous culture so the the dress can uh, sort of express the uh, the ethnicity of a certain community and it should be native as well right so what it said was that uh, sari is an indian dress that was imported from india and from you know uh, then onwards it should be a native dress and to make it a native dress we should uh, sort of use indigenous patterns to print sarees so sari should be uh, a more singhala dress was the idea that emerged in the 1950s 
So uh, I'm not going to uh, tell you what these pictures are. Just you know, I'm just going to say you know this is the image actually uh, uh, created by the inventing a national dress in the early 20th century. You know, the sari, uh, there, we, we think there is a sari, the Tamil sari, Singhala sari, and Muslim sari, even though it's a six yard of clothes draped on women's body in a different styles. So this idea that, you know, the biological body can be a site to express gender and nationalism was actually emerged during the uh, early 20th century in, in Sri Lanka. And actually uh, that basically it was to demarcate, you know, us from the imperialists and also from the rest of the natives in Sri Lanka. In order to, you know, claim who has the right to live in Sri Lanka. And uh, I think Veranga, I, I am not sure whether I have much time to talk about this, but the sari actually became a contested uh, garment in terms of nationalism and gender in Sri Lanka during this time period. Um, uh, I think I'll stop here and uh, we can talk about this later on. Yes. Uh... Thank you very much. Did I take more time? I'm sorry. Uh, no, sorry. no, that's fine. That's fine. That's totally. And, and it was very interesting. I, I didn't have a heart to stop you. So uh, it was very interesting. So uh, without taking much time, I'll uh, move to uh, Ms. Unnati. Uh, and if uh, the, for the participants, if you have any questions, uh, you can uh, type them in the chat box. So as soon as uh, the uh, session is done, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be having a short uh, Q&A session as well. Uh, Ms. Unnati? Yes, Paranga. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Javadana, for uh, such an informative and interesting uh, explanation. Uh, actually, uh, when Veranga invited me for this discussion, given the short time also I had to prepare, I was thinking of how to structure uh, this presentation and uh, which key points I should raise. So I thought I would start my uh, presentation sharing my own experience in relation to the sari in Sri Lanka. Thus, this presentation is going to be based on my self-reflexivity, both as a woman grown up in Sri Lanka and as an early career sociologist who attempts to explore the social world with a critical approach. Because of the time limit, also it's just a mid like two two thirty a.m. here in the morning. So I I just didn't want to ramble myself. So I'll be reading uh, mostly the the information that I have collected. So coming back to my story, uh, some time back, it was during probably two thousand fourteen or two thousand fifteen. I did a paper presentation in one of the international women's conferences in Sri Lanka, uh, based on my master's research, which, which was about the Sri Lankan transgender community. After the presentation, one of the comments I got from a senior activist in women's rights groups was that she was shocked when a young woman wearing a Kandyan sari with long hair and soft-spoken feminine feature just came and started talking about transgender, which she had never expected. This comment was somewhere in my memory because it actually opens up a number of socio-cultural discourses related not only to this inanimate object, the sari, but also to women and non-binary people too. First, the sari becomes gendered where a certain form of femininity is emphasized in relation to the sari, which often develop, uh, develops a socially acceptable, respectable women category 
or identity. Second, the notion of women's official dress code, which I had in my mind when attending the conference. The third, homogenization of women and the sari as women's attire as a category overlooking the intersectionalities within it. Fourth, what are the dominant discourses today around trans women and non-binary people wearing the sari? Give me a second, please. So I would like to start sharing my screen. I hope that you can see my screen now. Yes, ma'am, we can see. So, uh, therefore, uh, I would like to structure my presentation based on a few areas that I would like to touch in this presentation. Romanticization of the sari, uh, South Asian hybridity and sartorial cultural influence, uh, the notion of official dress code, the choice of individual, heterogeneity of women and women's attire of the sari, uh, acknowledging intersectionality. Also sari as attire only permissible for cisgender women, social stigma, and stigma towards non-binary people and trans women. I start my argument showing how we in the contemporary context romanticize the sari not only as a cultural attire of the Sri Lankan women, but also idealize certain forms of femininity ascribed to it. Uh, in this presentation, I use uh, images downloaded from the internet and social media in order to develop my argument. Uh, I think uh, as Dr. Jayavardhana also clearly explained, the sari was not a gendered cloth only towards women in historical Sri Lanka. With the uh, influence of the British colonial project and subsequent interna internalization of the Victorian norms and values into the Sri Lankan context, the sari became a gendered cloth towards women where fo some forms of femininity, masculinity were given. Interestingly, Geraldine Forbes writes a book in 1906, 1996 called Women in Modern India. She argues in this book how modern women in colonial India were expected to act as spiritual transmitters living within the inside sphere of home, supporting the nationalist project where home was treated as the source of the true identity. I like to bring this statement to the romanticization of sari in the contemporary Sri Lankan context, where we expect the sari as a women's attire, which brings out the perceived notions of beauty in women. One should not forget that certain ideo ideologies related to moral value, decency, cultural beliefs, and nationalism largely affect towards Sri Lankan women wearing a sari, often in terms of regulating and moral policing. As you can see in these images, the, the, in the, on your left-hand side image, uh, uh, it says somewhere, Purudu unahama ratak illua vage satutu hitena ganiata ganiata lassanam sariya. The second image shares certain, shares certain instructions to be a woman, which symbolizes how good, respectable, socially acceptable women have to be with the sari and certain other feminine characters. So today, we use the sari not merely as clothing, but it symbolizes certain forms of socially acceptable, respectable femininity, which is problematic. The problem of such articulation is we tend to neglect 
the phenomena that this social construction also lies on one's guess. For instance, the visual media largely depends on images. Then such images can be fragmented images of a women's body for their commercial purposes, which are subject to male gaze. The point is, with such a male gaze, whether or not a woman wears the sari, it still can be used for robbing them of their agency and treated them as treated them just with a passive objectification of women's bodies. In other words, it is perfectly possible for one to evoke vulgarity with women either fully covered in a sari or fully naked depending on the voyeuristic camera angles used in the visual media as well as the level of male gaze one has internalized within themselves. The romanticization of the sari further raises the question of the sari being so-called Sinhala Buddhist culturally appropriate attire for women. Uh, I'm quoting the Soisa says the Kandyan sari today is a hybrid costume. Also Vikrama Singh, huh? The main reason for the Osiria as the national dress was its Candian origin. The Osiria, sorry, <clears throat> was seen not only as the moral dress, but also as the authentic, unspoiled and pure dress of the Sinhalese. And this in spite of its appearance during the Nayakar period. So uh, Dr. Jayavadana in spoke about this uh, like informatively she tried to explain this. The notion I would like to briefly connect with the ideas of South Asian hybridity and sartorial cultural influence, which actually show that the Kandyan sari we call as the authentic pure national costume for Sri Lankan Sinhala women today is actually an evolution of people's attire with the influence from India, Britain, and the larger South Asia and Southeast, A Southeast Asian context. Further, uh, there might be a, a caste indigenous identity and social background, such as elite, aristocratic, and everyday related differences in relation to women's way of dressing, including the sari. These are some pictures I found in internet, uh, how the differences between men and women clothing and during certain time periods. However, it is important to understand the cultural hybridity and sartorial cultural influence behind the sari becoming a way of women's clothing, which later ironically have been identified as the Sri Lankan traditional women's attire, which we blindly follow even in the contemporary Sri Lanka. This demonstrates how social constructions dominate women's clothing and the way of speaking and behaving or performing a gender role. In other words, the idea of performativity is largely affected by the social constructions surrounding the sari. In addition, gender, gendered clothing further naturalizes the gender binary. Following such articulations of sari as the socially acceptable and respectable women's attire brings unwritten regulations today that Sri Lankan public servants official dress code is the sari. I use the term unwritten regulation because mostly it is written as appropriate clothing in most appointment letters. Yet we unintentionally follow the social constructions of sari as the only appropriate clothing in formal workplaces in Sri Lanka. Uh, Jai Surya, Saliadi Silva, and Vanigasundara write a journal, 
article dress codes of female employees and their job performances in sri lanka in 2020 they write uh, i quote that a dress code could be decided to ensure maximum job, job performance based on scientific grounds and individual preferences not merely based on cultural factors as you can see in this uh, picture also that uh, this shows the evolution of women's clothing in sri lanka so they also st uh, their study also suggests that the evolution of female attire in sri lanka has been mainly based on nationalism and culture and the study points out that the dress norms for men and women in sri lanka have evolved differently where the nationalist and cultural approaches only influence women to wear sarees Uh, now I would like to move to the uh, debate that claims wearing a sari is a choice of the individual. On uh, May two thousand May uh, twenty-nine, by Secretary of Public Administration and Disaster Management Ministry, issued a circular titled "Ensuring Security." in the office premises of the government it has been noted that public officers arriving in office premises during the office hours should be dressed in a certain manner males in trousers shirts or national dress females in sari or oh, sorry indicating that abaya may no longer be a permitted outfit a choice for Muslim female public servants. I came to know from Dr. Jayavadana the circular has been changed to appropriate clothing later. In the interest of uh, time, I'm not trying to go to the discussion of parallels between hijab and sari here. I want to focus on public comments regarding this circular, which were posted online on this particular news item. So as you can see, here it says the circular issued by the, uh, these are public comments I got from the same news item. Uh, the circular issued by the public administration is commendable. The sari is the most common attire for all ethnic groups in Sri Lanka. All Sinhala, Tamil and Muslim women wear saris. There is nothing wrong with such circular, with the circular. Also another comment, also the Tamil wear saris and the Sinhalese also wear saris. Wearing abaya is the culture of Muslim women. The third post, it's, it's quite contradictory because uh, it, it, it starts saying uh, pure stupid, uh, I'm a Sinhala Buddhist, but then it says, while I'm strongly against wearing burqa or going out nude, p uh, poorly dressed bikini in Sri Lanka, which are totally against the Sri Lankan culture, this decision is ultimately stupid. Actually, this does show how sari as a Sri Lankan women's attire has been socially constructed without understanding its hybrid nature in the past. This kind of social attitude, attitude is not very uncommon in Sri Lanka, where the majority of general public expects the Sri Lankan women to wear a sari to portray the moral values, decency, cultural beliefs, nationalism, and to gain respectability. Departing from the general public visible attitude, while partly agreeing to the point that wearing a sari should be a choice of the individual, I would raise two questions here. The question related to power and hierarchy and question related to whether choice is always autonomous and informed choice. In the practical context, when a group of senior colleagues in the office place follow the unwritten rule of only appropriate dress in the workplace as a sari for female workers, there is a hierarchical power influence towards 
junior colleagues who do not carry the power to take the decision as an individual choice. In such context, the dominant decision with unwritten rules may become a collective decision to be followed by all female workers. Okay. Now, I like to bring your attention to the heterogeneity of the category of women, which appear to me as often overlooked when it comes to our topic of the sari. There are differences in the styles that women wear saris in terms of ethnicity, religion, caste and gender in contemporary Sri Lanka. These differences may lead to experience different treatments and even uh, stereotypes towards different women groups on the basis of being Sinhala Buddhist, Tamil Hindu and Muslim Islam. Also, when certain ideologies such as nationalism, decency, respect, moral values become dominating factors in a society which decides women's clothing. There are women with intersecting identities in terms of ethnicity, religion, caste, gender, etc., gender and class, etc., who are being affected more than some dominant social groups related women. I believe there is a lot of scope for future research in the area of women with intersecting identities wearing the sari and gendered clothing general. Following the argument of intersectionality of women in relation to the sari draping, now I would like to connect this to the final part of my presentation. Here, I would like to uh, raise the question in contemporary Sri Lanka, whether we socially accept any women wearing a sari in general public. I would like to specifically focus on trans women, gender non-conforming and non-binary people in this discussion to raise the point within the socio-cultural discourse of decency, respectability, etc., because certain women are expected to wear a sari and act as bearers and transmitters of the moral, spiritual, and cultural values. Whereas trans women and non-binary people are socially excluded from wearing the sari. Uh, on your left-hand side, that is a photograph of notch girls wearing saris in 18th and 19th century, who are believed to be temple dancers, mostly with the Tamil origin. Citing ne uh, Neville in 2009, Miller and Nichols in 2012 describe the term Nachi derived from the Notch girls of India, who were dancers in the Raj during the 18th and 19th centuries. Nachi is the most uh, is the word used for the Sri Lankan transgender community, but mostly for those who engage in sex work. As M Miller and Nichols uh, explain, Nachi is an insider term adopted by their study participants, whom sex workers and mostly effeminate transgender as well as consensual gay. Miller and Nichols conceptualize the term Nachi, who are both transgender and homosexual, importantly, who left masculine features and identified their gender identity in terms of feminine features. The larger social attitudes towards trans women and non-binary people, for instance, in the social media showcase, how sari has been appropriate only for a certain group of women while excluding trans women and non-binary people largely from such women's clothing. Thus, it is clear sari has become a dominant women's attire in the Sri Lankan contemporary context with misinterpretations of historic historicities 
with the impact of colonialism and nationalism, due to which certain groups of women were also excluded in the process. Moving to the conclusion, in this presentation, I attempted to show that Kandyan, Osiria, and Saria, as only acceptable women's attire transmitted through generations is a myth. I wanted to discuss, discuss the hybrid nature of the sari influenced by different regions, particularly within South Asia and Southeast Asia, as opposed to the singularity and authenticity ascribed to it in contemporary society. This, uh, the singularity and the authenticity were attached particularly following the colonialism and nationalism as explained by scholars like, scholars like Nira Vikramasinghe. However, today, through certain sociocultural discourses, we rather romanticize the sari, ascribing a certain form of femininity, femininity towards it. Following such problematic social constructions, eventually women are being expected to wear the sari, irrespective of the weather, choice, form of work, comfort, affordability, etc. Thereby, female bodies are being regulated and policed. This presentation also sheds light on the problem of homogenizing women, thereby overlooking the intersecting identities of women in terms of class, ethnicity, religion, sexuality, gender, etc. Thus, it is important to understand women as a heterogeneous group and also gender identity as a spectrum. These are my references and I would like to stop my presentation from here. Veranga, you can take over. Yes, uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, and we would like that was, that was a very uh, interesting uh, presentation and uh, explanation. And uh, we would like to open the uh, floor for the participants, uh, for your questions, your comments, uh, uh, anything. Uh, uh, we have like uh, 10 to 15 minutes uh, for the question. Uh, yes, someone has raised hand. Uh, just give me a second. Okay. Uh, Dil Dishani Senegratna. Yeah, you you can. Uh, Thank you, Veranga. Uh, thank you to both the speakers for their insightful presentations. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Yes, my question is, uh, how would you see the future of the sari? Yeah, that's my question. Uh, uh, Dr. Janiki, Ms. Uh, uh, you both uh, can, uh, any of you can take the question. Um, Veranga, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, because I, I, I'm not sure because I'm now logging from my phone. Okay. Because of the power cut. Um, anyways, I think, uh, you know, like, uh, if you, I mean, uh, I think uh, two ideas were presented in uh, our presentations. Unati was talking about sari as a, you know, uh, uh, style and also, you know, a dress, a feminine dress. And I was talking, I, I talked about, uh, you know, how sari sort of demarcate and uh, uh, impose certain uh, nationalistic notions on the biological body, right? So, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a question very difficult to answer about the future of the sari. But one thing is sure that, you know, the sari as a dress won't disappear because, you know, all the styles, certain times, you know, uh, styles disappear, then come back, uh, you know. 
and uh, sari being a feminine dress i think is also i think uh, it will remain as a feminine dress because uh, i had a discussion with another group some time back and you know when i asked them about you know how you know this this certain traditions were invented to create a homogenized uh, ethnic identity for certain groups in sri lanka communities in sri lanka and then when i asked whether you want to go back to the ancient traditions and cultural habits and uh, they were saying certainly not because you know it's something that you can't live now because you know certain certain cultural habits traditions were considered as uncivilized in the uh, during the colonial time and and changed so they nobody wants to go back to like like for example we practiced uh, 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 polygamy bigamy right polygamy and polyandry i don't think uh, people would like to go back to such a such a marriage practices like likewise you know it's it's difficult to change certain cultural habits but i think uh, you know if we accept it as a dress for the women or as a feminine dress then i think nobody can question uh, transgendered people wearing sari or non binary people as as uh, unnati said because it's a choice and also that choice the right to that choice was endorsed by the constitution of this country so i think you know uh, we need to understand and accept it and also uh, uh, i mean this is what i see uh, uh, okay yeah uh, yeah uh, miss unadi uh, do you want to add something to that so uh... i think uh, dr jayawardena uh, gave a in- informative answer for that i uh, i was also thinking about the fashion and popular culture it's 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 actually a quite a tough question because uh, we we there's a huge uh, i would say a gap between the uh, popular understanding of popular culture and fashion in the common society so in that sense i would say it's more about the uh, informed choice of a woman if we can understand and respect to that uh the future of sari would be much uh, nicer that including and accepting all kind of women to wear it within within not because society or the family or the any body expect them to wear it but because they are informed and they in, with the informed choice that's it i guess yeah uh, any any one else any questions any other questions uh okay and uh, we have another question from uh, carmen uh, vikrama gamage i don't know whether i'm reading your name correct uh, yeah you can you can go ahead yes you are reading my uh, name correctly carmen vikram gamage uh, my question is uh, i've uh, i was listening to both uh, speakers and very interesting i was wondering whether, whether i mean i could pose a question this way do uh, does the sari wear us or do we wear the sari uh, so uh, by that what i'm saying is uh, when we kind of uh, turn the sari or elevate the sari into a scary monster type thing something that's there to wrap us around and completely overwhelm us whether we are also there by uh, undermining the agency of the wearer so uh, if we look at it that way i think uh, we women uh, have also uh, learned to uh, use the sari or deploy it or manipulate it uh, for our own purposes and uh, and that's what we are we are human beings we are we have our own reasons for doing what we do men or women uh, so uh, and of course all other genders uh, so um, 
in a in a way i think now i'll give you one example there was a time i think this was the 60s or 70s maybe long before your time <laughs> uh, when there was the hipster sari you know and uh, there was a very well known academic at the time at kalania university he used to wear the hipster sari so uh, and when you do that you kind of completely uh, sort of uh, deconstruct all of the 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 values and the the, uh, the 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 symbolism that we have kind of uh, associated with the sari uh, even now i see uh, women at particularly at university and other places wearing the sari um, and particularly the the and the, and of course the the blouse in uh, in particular ways uh, so uh, so there are there are many many uh, there are there are ways in which uh, we humans uh, have been uh, have been uh, using the sari for for various purposes so and as a, and i would also like to suggest that the the sari uh, is also an evolving garment for for the same reason maybe they are connected uh, its status its uh, significance its symbolism have also changed so i don't think uh, uh, it has remained uh, monolithic uh, in terms of its uh, meaning and status. Uh, uh, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Right. Uh, so just one thing I wanted to uh, uh, ask. Uh, now, we know that there is no certain uh, legal uh, uh, a regulation uh, for women to wear, uh, wear sari at work. Uh, but I was wondering uh, in an institution like uh, Sri Lanka Parliament, is, uh, is, there, a, is there a certain uh, dress code for women uh, in, in, within the parliament? Uh, uh, does uh, any of you uh, are aware of, uh, about the fact? <laughs> Should I answer this? Uh, yes, where yes please. Yeah, I um, yeah. Thank you, Professor Carmen. Uh, I I remember seeing you as a beautiful woman in a sari in my first year when you taught me, and we always talked about your beauty and the way you wear sari. I'm sorry to say this, and yeah, I I agree with you uh, to a certain point because sari can be subversive as well. But again, uh, that also kind of, you know, uh, in, a, in, 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 in what ways, right? Because one thing is that in Sri Lanka, sari is considered as the appropriate dress for women, right? And also it, it sort of symbolized the, the, the honor and, you know, uh, of women. I remember uh, going to Jaffna uh, right after the war to see, you know, to meet some government officers and uh, uh, one of these uh, grammar sevaka, female grammar sevaka was, you know, complaining. Uh, she complained how uh, now the Jaffna girls also go around in uh, city wearing t-shirts and uh, denims and, uh, you know, bearing their midriff as girls in other uh, you know, parts of Sri Lanka. And then, you know, this Tamil girl asked, uh, you know, then you are wearing a sari because she was wearing a sari and it was actually almost like a hipster and her navel was, you know, revealed uh, the way she was wearing the sari. And then uh, this girl asked, you know, you are also wearing your midriff. And then this lady said, it's a res respectable way of, you know, showing your midriff. Now, that idea is also there. And also, I think, you know, like, uh, you know, yeah, some people, some, some women may want to be a sex object as well, you know, to please women, men, you know, to be more attractive. And uh, I don't know whether, I mean, in terms of agency, how much, you know, what, what happens to women, like, you know, when being, an, being, being a sex object, by wearing sari in a certain, uh, draping sari in a certain uh, style. Uh, that is also there. And also the um, uh, other thing, Veranga, you asked uh, whether there are institutional uh, uh, 
problems issues is that what you asked yes i, I was wondering uh, if in in terms of uh, sri lanka parliament uh, like the members of the uh, parliament yes, yes, the parliament yes. the, the female parliamentarians are are, uh, are they supposed to uh, adhere to a certain dress code i think that is also there is a dress code i think uh, um, i don't remember seeing women coming in anything other than sari to parliament i'm not sure whether you know in in like 1940s uh, whoever came to parliament whether they came in uh, european dresses i'm not sure because i'm not seen any any pictures uh, but uh, for the courts i know that uh, there is a rule i think that women should wear sari female lawyers if i'm not mistaken uh, no i don't think uh, i'm sorry professor yeah. dr javadan yeah. no no it, it 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 is just the sober colors and i think there's been this uh, case of uh, a very well known female lawyer who actually did change that uh, by wearing white and yeah. black uh, uh, pants suit uh, yeah. So, so, so yeah so so there is no rule no. against coming in other uh, type no. of uh, dresses uh, but uh, sober okay. and that Whole yeah. idea. but there is this i think you know the 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 invisible rule that women should come in sari i mean it, that i think is there even in in parliament and and most mostly in, in schools you know they publicly uh, say that you can't come to schools uh, you know if you are not in in sari Yeah. and i remember like going into my daughter's uh, school's uh, uh, sports meet and and uh, you know uh, the they had this competition for mothers a uh, race and uh, i saw one mother was uh, going towards the you know the line uh, and she was wearing a salva kameez and uh, then they announced and said women who are not in sarees can't run and then all the women who were running in sarees were actually they were falling down because it was very difficult to run with the saree but that is the attitude uh, i think uh, especially in schools i mean it it's like a it's like a draconian law you know you can't go to a school and you know check your child's uh, progress if you are not in a saree yes and uh, i think we have another uh, comment in the chat box as well uh, i'll read it out uh, by lakmali gunasekara there have been certain uh, there have been few occasions when uh, mps were ordered to leave the chambers as their attire was found to be inappropriate the most recent instance concerned k uh, tangeshwari who was uh, ordered to leave when she came into the chambers wearing a salva kameez a similar incident occurred when uh, uh, shrimani atulath mudali came wearing a skirt and blouse in 1919 uh, according to daily mirror that's what she has mentioned and uh, thank you very much for that and uh, uh, when dr janaki was uh, mentioning about the schools and how uh, teachers and all the parents are, uh, have to like they are, they, it's a mandatory thing that they have to wear a sari i was also uh, thinking about for a, a, a Uh, like in the past couple of months uh, about the human hours that we spend on uh, on you know wearing a sari and you know uh, on sari specifically like uh, buying this uh, garment and uh, you know uh, cleaning it ironing it and draping it and getting ready with it uh, so it's it's a kind of uh, like certain number of human hours uh, is involved in this uh, uh, certain uh, process uh so yeah uh, and and also i think it has a certain economic aspect as well uh like uh, uh whether a government teacher can really uh, afford uh, to to wear a sari in this situation like uh, and and is it uh, is it feasible like is it uh, comfortable to to for her to work in sari throughout the day we especially in 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 countries like sri lanka with the weather and everything uh, okay uh, so veranka um, can uh, i yeah, sure. yes yes please go ahead uh, uh, anyone yes, can yes ranga um, can... i would like to make a comment here 
Yes. So uh, when you are raising a question regarding the dress of the female parliamentarian, yes, uh, that one has mentioned that uh, there are several incidents in the parliament. Okay. So uh, I would like to uh, draw your attention for a special incident regarding the Sri Maniya Thurat Mudali that uh, once she had a lower abdominal surgery. So there, mm -hmm. then uh, she made a request to the Speaker of the Parliament that allow her to wear uh, a dress other than the sari. So then at that time, having a special consideration, she got uh, permission to dress a gown-like uh, dress other than a sari. So thank yes. you, Ranga. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that, was, that was very insightful. And uh, uh, someone else was raising a, uh, uh, commenting something. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, is there any yeah, other? It's actually yeah, me. yeah, um, please, Charit. it's actually Charit. Charit right here. Yeah. So uh, this is actually regarding the school incident. The teachers are not allowed to wear sari. So I used to teach at uh, one of the national schools uh, in Colombo like last year. So there, actually, it's very progressive because we were allowed to wear pants if you want to. But there are also uh, like sectional heads and permanent teachers, they have to wear saris. But the rest of the teachers, we were allowed to wear pants, which is like a, a show of the, of like, let's say the status or the power. So I guess even when you are traveling by a bus, uh, a person who's wearing a sari will be a miss and a person who's wearing a pant will be a ka or nangi. So yeah, I just wanted to uh, touch on that area too about the schools and the dress code. Yes, thank you, Sharitra. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, any other questions? Any other comments? Uh, we, if not, we can wrap up the session. Okay. Uh, right. So uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Janaki and Ms. Unnati, uh, like for. Uh, taking part in this uh, very insightful session, right? And uh, especially on uh, a, a special day like this, uh, uh, like concerning uh, women uh, on International Women's Day, uh, uh, especially uh, in a, such a short notice, I got to both of you in uh, within last week and uh, you both were, were like very uh, helpful and uh, at once you said, okay, uh, we will we, we, we be able to do that. And, uh, and also Ms. Unnati, I, I know it, it's quite late there, but still you uh, uh, agreed to my request and uh, take part, part in this. So uh, I would like to thank uh, both of you uh, for your uh, participation in this and for all the uh, insightful presentations and explanations that you uh, came up with. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, all the participants and your interesting questions, uh, which definitely made this session very uh, interesting and uh, also very much, uh, they were like other areas for us to think about in terms of research and uh, uh, in terms of uh, other academic activities. So uh, we are going to wrap up this session. Uh, I would also like to thank the Dean of our faculty, Dr. Kamalika Jayatilaka. Uh, she was very uh, insisting that uh, we have to do something uh, for Women's Day. Uh, and uh, so uh, I will be sharing because number of you requested uh, whether we can, we can share the recording. Uh, uh, yes, I will uh, get back to both speakers uh, and get their consent and I'll send you the recording. Uh, you can, uh, uh, I will send my email address uh, in the chat box. Uh, so you can send me a request and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll drop you the uh, recording with the consent of the speaker. So thank you very much for joining with us, uh, uh, despite of power cuts and power failures and everything. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Janiki and uh, Ms. Unati. Uh, so we are going to wrap up the session. Uh, good night, everyone.